medical engineering. And on behalf of Claire and myself, we uh, co-chair the research, Drexel's Research Operations Working Group. And on behalf of uh, the committee at large, or the group at large, we're happy to welcome you all here today. We have a full agenda, and we're already behind by about 15 minutes, so we're going to blow through a lot of the slides. Um, but first, we'd like to uh, get started by orienting you all to our working group, why we're here, and what the goals are of this, for this meeting. Um, so the Research Operation Working Group, just to give you a brief history, is in um, August of 2014, Alistair Saunders and Deb Crawford approached Moira and, I, and myself to start the working group as a means of facilitating collegial communications between the Office of Research and the community of research administrators spanning the university. Moira and I are the first co-chairs of this committee, and we had our first meeting in January 2015. And right now we have 37 active members spanning the colleges and business units. To date, we've had 12 meetings, and this makes our 13th official meeting here today. Just to give you an overview, this slide shows the current membership of the Research Operations Working Group. We included it in our presentation just to demonstrate the broad representation across the colleges, departments, and business units. We are here today to broaden our audience and to share with our fellow research administrators what has been going on with the working group, the Office of Research and Research Accounting Services and related business units. Today's attendees, similar to the membership of the Research Operations Working Group, we have an excellent representation from the community here today spanning all the colleges and business units. We'd like to thank Alistair for his support and guidance in bringing us all together for this event. So now I will turn it over to Moira, who will discuss the purpose and the mission of the working group. I'll just give a brief background. Um, the working group identifies challenges, uh, administrative challenges facing Drexel researchers and research administrators, and we recommend creative solutions that ultimately will enhance and support Drexel's growing research enterprise. From the outset, we were charged uh, with fostering and supporting collaborative and productive relationships between Drexel's diverse administrative and academic units and to strengthen Drexel's research administration infrastructure. So we view today as an extension of this charge and hope to facilitate a productive and positive dialogue among all stakeholders. We hope that this meeting will provide a venue for collegial conversation about how we can work together to improve research administration here at Drexel. Just to give you an overview of the educational collaborations of note since we've formed the committee, we, um, the Biosketch Update Project we, was our first collaboration with the Working Committee. It gave us a great opportunity to work with the library to produce relevant materials to support our investigators. I'd like to just call, on, uh, call out uh, Stasha Levy, Amanda Verone, and Annalisa Wells, who were from the pre-award. Um, from Drexel Libraries, Beth Tenhaven, uh, Tenhave, Larry Milliken, and Jay Bott, which yielded a comprehensive library guide for my NCBI, Science CV, and Google Scholar citations. Um, most recently, we co-hosted co a webinar with Research Accounting Services on cost transfer best practices. And Evelyn Balabas also gave a presentation afterwards to bring it home how Drexel does cost transfers. And our <clears throat> current project, we are working with Dr. Stacy Ock, Karen Skinner from QAQI, and the RCR to develop materials to aid investigators in meeting the new NIH research rigor and reproducibility requirements for proposal applications. We have some uh, current activities underway and um, that might be of interest to the community. And one is governance. We'd like to formalize our committee better uh, to, to, to uh, broaden the roles and to define the roles. Uh, Claire and I will not be co-chairing for a long time, so we hope to uh, formalize that process for membership and uh, uh, leadership roles. We're also developing a SharePoint site. Uh, the link was provided as part of the reminder, so we will have um, all of the materials from our operations group will be is our archive there now, so I invite you to go check it out. And um, also, the materials from today's meeting will be posted there as well. We have um, a number of questions to be answered today, so if your questions are not answered, please go to that SharePoint as well, and we'll be providing follow-up there. And uh, one of our other 
goals or processes is to, to work more closely with uh, Alistair and the research office in pro business process redesign. So when policies are rolled out to the community, the faculty and business units perspective is represented in that process. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alistair Saunders, Vice Provost of Research. He'll now speak on CREG, and I'm just going to switch presentations here. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Brenda, how are you? So I'm going to give you a presentation that is about 20 slides long, maybe 25. I'm going to go quickly because we're behind schedule. Be happy to talk to any of you about that uh, as we go through. Sort of helps set the stage for what we're currently doing to improve our practices here at Drexel. Um, in terms of research administration and develop the research administration infrastructure for the university that we aspire to be. <clears throat> That's okay. Okay, so CRAE stands for the Campaign to Improve Research Administration Effectiveness. CRAE, um, I'd like to point out uh, P Patty Russo, uh, the comptroller who's involved with this, and Kyrie Williams from the Office of Research who's leading this effort for CRAE. So I'm going to tell you about what we do in the Office of Research, introduce you to the leadership team, talk about CRAE, why we're doing it, um, and we'll get to the heart of the matter. Okay, so that's, uh, thank you. So that's the Office of Research uh, by FTEs. Research administration, about 65%, about 34% research compliance, about 1% strategy, that's me and Gwen. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that broken down by budget, <clears throat> research accounting services, pre-award operations, human research protection, the Finance Competency Center, the uh, VP for Research and the Research Competency Center, we're about $5.9 million. It's about 5.4% of the total research expenditures of the university. That's a, a pretty efficient system. Next slide. So we've got a number of people here today. I'm not sure everyone's here. Miguel, Maureen, Kyrie, Stasha, Evelyn, and Patty. You'll see them, a uh, number of them up here at the panel at the end of the presentation. So the next slide. Um, you know better than anyone that to manage $110 million in research expenditures, you need robust pre and post award services. <clears throat> that $110 million in research expenditures is the second biggest source of revenue to the university after tuition. So in terms of who we are as a university, research is really important. So we live in this research uh, climate that's very dynamic in terms of regula regulations. I just saw a slide recently where it shows research regulations on the y-axis, on the x-axis is time, and the number of regulations just is going up. And there's no plateau. So it's dynamic, we've got to stay abreast. The compliance, if you're non-compliant, there's significant issues. Um, so, when I became interim, we had some significant leader ch leadership changes in addition to Deb Crawford leaving for uh, Berkeley. Uh, we had uh, Mike Edwards and Tim Devine and Patty Groshan leave the Office of Research. Um, as part of that, ch that change, we, President Fry requested our auditors, PricewaterhouseCoopers, to do a study of research administration functions. Uh, within the office. That started in January, uh, November, lasted until January. We got the final report in March of last year. Um, in that, some of you were probably interviewed, a number of us were interviewed. Um, the people that did this study do this at research universities across the, uh, the country, they know best practices. They did a really good job. So we got that final report in March of 15. And the way they did that, if you go back one slide, yeah, if you can go back one slide. 
So what they did is they looked at this research administration cycle for proposal development, internal review and submission, pre-award, award setup, award management, and closeout. You know, if you've got a five-year R01, that award management's a big chunk of time. Um, obviously, the whole time you're monitoring this to make sure it's com and monitoring and make sure it's compliant. You need information systems and applications to make sure that's working correctly and seamlessly, and you need policies and procedures. So this is the context by which they did their study. On the next slide, what you'll see is a summary of their findings. <clears throat> they found stuff, not surprisingly. They found 48 findings, which is a lot if you're an auditor. So they, they, they ranked these by risk, so we had high, medium, and low. High was in post-award, high was in research operations, high was in uh, research systems medium and financial compliance, low and human research protection, pre-award and contracts. Um, if you go to the next slide, Claire. Uh, research integrity, low, QA, QI, low, uh, radiation safety and regulatory compliance, low. We'll go into the little details of that. So one of the key observations were is we need to develop updated policies, standard operating procedures, checklists, job aids to create consistency. You may have seen that you might talk to one person, you're treated one way, you talk to another person, the Office of Research is handled a different way. Uh, we can't do that, we have to make sure uh, we do it the same. It works now for some reason. Um, we need to update our procedures regularly and educate the community on the regulatory change specifically the uniform guidance that went in. Let's see if it works. Yep, it works now. We have significant information systems needs, COEUS, Banner, et cetera. We have, a, we have gaps in the IT uh, systems. COEUS doesn't talk to Banner, so we're manually inputting the budget you put into COEUS, we're manually inputting into Banner. You know, that's, that's why we have computers, right? They should talk to one another. It's just an opportunity to make mistakes and take people that should be analyzing grants and making them be data entry specialists. Um, so we, they said to us, PwC said to, the, PwC said to us, look, you have the right systems, but often you just haven't implemented certain functionalities. That's specifically the billing functionality with the banner. We don't have standardized reports. We don't have automated workflows. And there's these unidirectional flows or sometimes no flows between those systems. We need to cross-train staff. They said that our staffing level was similar to our peer institutions for this amount of research uh, uh, expenditures. However, our systems were so inefficient that we were probably understaffed because we have really inefficient systems. So a um, number of, I'm not going to go through all these, we should have a dashboard of key metrics. We need to move to a paperless environment. We need a more proactive approach to the closeout. We have varying levels of clinical blind billing compliance. Um, we need to develop a research operations group meetings. Ta-da, this is one of them. We've been meeting for over a year with the research operations working groups. We need to create a cross-functional teams of research, finance, HR, procurement, IT. Our colleagues from those units are here today and have been at the table for a long time. Um, and things like uh, ULAR should be under the VP for research rather than the College of Medicine. So, that's a high-level overview. It gets really down into the weeds. We'd be happy to share that with you. Um, so, what we did in response to this was to create this campaign to improve research administration effectiveness. It's called C-Ray. We're addressing all 49 of those findings. We're using a project management approach to do that. We report regularly on progress. So, me, Patty, and Kyrie, President, COO, Board of Trustees every quarter. We also interact with the Research Operations Working Group monthly. Uh, we just came from a meeting from, what is the customer service from Helen's group, what is it, program, uh, effectiveness, management, you got a survey, right? So we just came from a meeting from that to help us understand that. So we need to, uh, we need to report on our progress and most importantly, the president, the provost, the COO have all been involved from, with this from the get-go and know what we're doing and uh, are making sure we're doing what we say we're going to do. So this is, a, this is about a four-minute movie that I'm not going to play. But as we say, so this is a group of young men driving in the desert on two wheels 
that they're driving on and changing the other two wheels simultaneously. It's terrifying to watch. Uh, I'm just waiting for that guy in the front to fall off and get run over. But they're driving the car and fixing it while they're driving. That's what we're trying to do. It's precarious. Uh, we're doing our best. So what have we done to date? Well, the first thing we did is within uh, the Office of Research, we moved post award from Office of Research under the Comptroller's Office. Patty Russo came with a large background in research administration and research accounting. It only makes sense for an accountant to oversee accountants. Okay, so that's why we made that change. In addition, we've hired Evelyn Balibus. Evelyn's been here just a year, right, Evelyn? Uh, came from Emory, before that UCLA, before that Penn, where she was post-award. Miguel is an accountant slash information scientist. He's helping us and working well with IRT to improve the reporting and information systems that we need. Maureen Wade came up from IRT to help us on the pre-award and information side of things. And then Kyrie is leading the C-Ray effort. So we've got a very, very detailed task, uh, set of tasks. How long is it, Kyrie? How many pages? A hundred and something? Hundreds of pages long of specific tasks to take those 48 findings, those 19 projects, and go down. So we've taken those 49 findings. We've got 19 groups. We each have, each task and subtask has owners, collaborators, and we have timelines established. And that's what we report to the Board of Trustees. We need to communicate this. This is part of this. We have, we've done a number of town halls to different colleges, uh, different meetings, the research operations working groups. Um, so we're communicating. We started the newsletter to help us do that, which comes out semi-monthly. Um, we're engaging partners, you know, all across the university. We meet regularly with the Associate Deans for Research, the Rogue. We're having this research administration all hands meeting as well. So training is essential. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll start on that now. I, I'm gonna invite you all to participate in something we're calling C-Ray Task Force. That's a collaboration between you, <coughs> the community, and the Office of Research and RAS uh, staff where we're identifying specific pinch points, things we can improve, uh, and together work on a solution. Um, so people from the Office of Research and RAS have signed up for that. After this meeting, I'm gonna send the link out to you and you can sign up. From the Office of Research and RAS, what we found the biggest point that people wanna talk about is training. Training, 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 training. Look, we're gonna be training and we're gonna be changing the way we do things and we're gonna to need to train more. So in some cases we've gone slower because we can change things really quickly, but if we don't train people how to do it, it's useless. So uh, we've gotta moderate that change in training education po point. So um, we're also, you need financial reports, especially in RCM, which Tom and JB will talk about. Transparency, transparency, transparency. You need that, we need to give you more data than you currently get. Okay, we're working on clinical trial billing, we're updating policies and procedures, we're improving processes, we're talking about IT systems. I'm not gonna go into all the details there. Um, so we need to define metrics to assess our progress towards the goals. We're continuing our monthly training and, uh, of staff in the research community. We're mandating the utilization of this uh, clinical conductor, and we're working with our partners. Um, Importantly, there's a lot of things that have been going on behind the curtain, especially in the IT side. One of those, Patty and her team have been remapping the data in the research accounting module so that we can roll out this research billing module that we think is going to happen right at the beginning of the new fiscal year. That is going to be huge, okay? Between that and rolling out effort reporting in labor distribution, we're hoping that that's really gonna change what research accounting services does from data entry to analysts, okay? That's coming and we still have to get there, but we think that's really gonna be tangible signs of the work we've been doing for the past year. So we're continuing to update and document policies, we wanna meet, and we're developing the C-Ray task force that I just talked about and that I'll invite you to after this meeting. 
So the goal here is to build a research administration services for the university that we aspire to be, and you need to be part of it. And you need to hold our feet to the fire because we can say all this stuff, but if we don't do it, it doesn't get us anywhere. So our goal really is to reduce the research administration burden on faculty so that they can focus their efforts on writing grants, writing papers, things that lift the research in the university, lift the reputation and ranking of the university. So that's our goal. It's a lofty goal. We'll continue to be lofty, but we're going to need help. And we really see this as another step in working together, and your participation in the C-Ray Task Force would be greatly appreciated. So I'll stop with that. We'll take questions later, but maybe now I'll hand it back to Claire. I'm just going to actually shift through the presentation to At this time, I'd actually like to introduce Tom Quinn. And I think there's something wrong with your slide, Tom. So I don't know. And J.B. Bowie. Thank you. Can everybody hear me OK? So J.B. and I have been going around. You've probably seen us a couple times. I don't know if that's good or bad when we walk in. but. Uh, um, we're talking about RCM as much as possible to as many people as possible because it's a complex system and um, we want to make sure we're out there that we receive feedback from everybody. What we're doing today is, uh, again, if some of you, most of you are from the colleges, you have seen some of this. We started with the general principles around RCM and then we're going to get into how it relates to research at the end. Um, and I didn't mention, but I'm Tom Quinn, this is J.B. Bowie, I'm from the provost office. He's from the budget office, and uh, JB will start the presentation. And again, some of you may, some of you may have uh, already been because we've been to some of the schools and colleges. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about a budget model. Why why do a budget model if it doesn't have the things up here? But the number one thing that we're trying to get to right now is transparency. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions of things that I don't think you've been able to see before. We're working through the answers. Hopefully, we're getting back and we're holding up our end on the transparency. But all the other things, again, are just key points to why, why change unless we're going to improve these areas. Okay. Uh, again, I, I mentioned transparency. This is a ground up model. And uh, uh, I would say Ed, Ed Gracely, right? Uh, I've, I've given this presentation a number of times, and Ed sent me some feedback. So, what is RCM? Uh, Let's talk about at Drexel, before we implemented RCM, uh, each of you budgeted by expense. We had expenses and you, and you spent to the expenses and that was it and it was uh, continuing services, permanent budget, whatever we call it, current services. So sorry I wasn't here for that part. Uh, now we're asking you to budget your revenue and then meet your expense to your revenue. And that's the difference. That's a key difference to what we're doing. We're doing that at the school and college level. So what I say from the ground up, okay, you're telling us what the revenues are, you're telling us what the expenses are, and obviously we've got to make them meet and make sure that we have a positive margin. So, so that's what RCM is. That's what our goal is, is to get each of you involved in the budgeting process through your schools and colleges, uh, through your units. Uh, let's see. Overhead expenses clearly identified. At this point, uh, that's one of the, the new things, or it was probably held centrally what the costs of the administrative and support units were. Now they're allocated to each unit, and we, we can explain exactly what they are and where they are. And again, we're, we have committees that will be responsible for holding them to, uh, to their budgets. Now they still do work with current services. And, and we are still building their budgets based on current services, and that'll be an, another uh, addition or growth of the, the RCM uh, model as we move forward. Uh, reporting and feedback, again, is an integral part to all of all 
models and all budget act activity. So we'll continue. That shouldn't, shouldn't be any different, but executive committee oversight. So we're asking each of, of your groups to provide budgets, provide revenue and expenses, and then we have oversight from executive committees who are reviewing those and trying to move forward. Are we moving in the directions that we, wanted, we want to move towards? Uh, how does some of this apply? Again, this is, this is fairly generic, and I will take questions at any point. If you have questions, please, please ask them. Uh, how are we determining, uh, there, there were some questions ahead of time about how we, were we determining uh, growth in, the, uh, in research? And the ANS committee, uh, I'm sorry, the administrative uh, and support allocation committee uh, is responsible for reviewing each of the administrative and support units and making sure that we understand their budgets and their services. Because this is part of the budget model is also looking at do we have overlapping services at the university? And are we using those services appropriately? So, so that's, there's, a, there's a specific committee, and I'll go through the com other committees here later, but uh, there's a specific committee that will look at how we're, we're handling our administrative and support, which the research office is a part of, and are we funding it properly, and is it meeting the services that we need, and are, is there redundancy in that, those services? So uh, the model itself also allows us to incentivize positive trends and behaviors. One of those is research. Okay, absolutely, that one of those is research, and we'll get to how we're, we incentivize it. Uh, and then we also establish the one fund. The one fund allows for strategic initiative. Okay, we are in our budget, as we put our budget together, we are uh, using some of the money for strategic initiative so we can grow. Uh, I'm not gonna, not gonna go too far or too deep into this, but every model, budget model, has revenue forecasting, again, the difference here is this is done at the primary, primary unit or revenue generating level. Uh, expense budgeting, everyone does their expense budgeting. Uh, indirect allocations is, as I mentioned earlier, the administrative and support unit, okay? The people who are supporting you, right? But don't generate revenue. So uh, that's, that's indirect allocations. Uh, the one university fund is how much we can put into our strategic initiatives. And then obviously we are budgeting to a, a positive bottom line. Okay, this is the, this is the one where we can, we can talk a little bit and we can get into some of, the, some of how research is impacted in the, uh, in the model. Uh, there we go. Okay, so our, as, as alluded to earlier, our number one revenue source is undergrad tuition. So the things up here, uh, the, the, re, the revenues up here are all taxed at 17% to create a participation or creates a participation fee that allows us to uh, move some money around to help people and help initiatives. Okay, that goes to the one fund and, and strategic initiatives. It's also used to make, make uh, units whole. But one of the key things here is the research allocation. From the undergraduate tuition, 20% of the undergraduate tuition is used as a research allocation. It's taken right off the top and allocated based on the amount of research you're doing. Okay, a three year average of the amount of research that you're, you're doing. So there's an allocation to cover administrative costs for research. Okay, and that's one of the key things that this model is designed to do and it, what it incentivizes. Okay, things that, that aren't taxed by the 17% are private gifts, sponsored revenues, and endowment income. Okay, our direct expenses uh, obviously are, are a part of each, you know, these are, again, you're telling us what these expenses are based on your, on your revenues. Your indirect costs are the uh, A&S costs. We also have what we call a support target. So right now, and I literally mean right now, uh, the primary units are, the schools and colleges are working towards a support target, meaning does my revenue and my expense uh, bring me to zero after they're subbeened from the 17%? Uh, and again, we come down to, the, to, the pro to a profit loss, again, a net positive. And the one fund allows us for strategic initiative. There's got to be a question out there somewhere. Excuse me, the research allocation, does that go central or does that go to units, schools and colleges? 
that goes to units, schools and colleges. Okay, I mentioned, uh, again, the point of the model is ground up, is schools and colleges telling us what their revenues are and what their expenses are, which is, is, a, very, is a, a lot different than a centralized budgeting system. And we're, we're working through it right now with, with all of the positives and the pains. So uh, there is executive committees associated with this. Uh, and let's see, the executive committee, I'm sorry, there are committees associated with this. The executive committee is uh, made up of the president, the COO, the uh, provost, and the head of the faculty senate. Okay, and they're, they're kind of final adjudicators on direction and how we, uh, how we finally balance the budget. Okay, as I mentioned earlier and kind of bolded it there, the administrative and support allocation committee are the ones that look at the administrative support and support allocation units to make sure that they're managing budgets appropriately and that they have the resources that they need from the university. Okay, again, the other three, capital asset, senate committee, and Senate faculty uh, are all, uh, again, looking at how we're doing the budgeting process and provide feedback for that. And you can see the, see down here a little bit of, of oversight. Questions about oversight from the committees. One of the key points there is there are faculty, there is faculty, there are staff, all represented in the entire process. Okay, one, ground up. We're asking for each of the schools and colleges to provide us with their information. And then in these committees, uh, specifically Tom and I both work with the A&S committee, the allocation committee, and all, everyone is represented. Uh, here's where we are. Oh, sorry. Here's where we are right here. You can see that the primary units have provided revenues and expenses. The, uh, we had contractual and strategic initiatives from the ANS units. Uh, and at this point, we're in the process of reviewing service level agreements. And again, this is a, a, a review to make sure that we're providing the level of service that we should be providing and, uh, and moving forward. As that, as that happens and after that happens, then there'll be a strategic initiative review right here where the executive committee will make decisions on what strategic initiatives we, we will fund. And that's also driven by what the profit loss is uh, for the university. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna chime in. Uh, this was a specific question and JB talked about this briefly, um, but I'm just gonna add to it. As Alistair pointed out, he, it's curious if it goes down to the unit, to the primary units, the schools and colleges. When we were implementing RCM um, at that time, and just like now, growing research is a strategic initiative. And in doing that, we all realized, and we knew this beforehand, but it wasn't explicit, is that research costs money. It costs money to do research. All of you are involved in determining the indirects that you're generating from your research grants, I would imagine, when you're, when you're submitting proposals, you see that. We know over time, um, you know, we're doing more foundation grants who pay hardly any indirects. Obviously, the federal government, the rate is 55, 56.5, say, it's always changing and getting better. Um, but what we realized back then, and, and true now, is that we're not collecting that full amount, obviously, with all the grants that we uh, generate. And even if we were to collect all of that, it still isn't enough to cover all the costs. So the costs are the Office of Research, the facilities, the research labs that we use, um, many of you uh, so support staff uh, to support research. So back then at that time, we were using undergraduate face-to-face -face tuition revenue to offset those costs. But not too many people knew that. I mean, it was just kind of behind the scenes. Okay, we have this operation, we're a research institution, we gotta cover those costs. What we decided to do in the model was make that explicit. Make it explicit, identify how we're paying for that, and also incentivize research. Because if we didn't do this, I mean, one of the, one of the, um, uh, the issues that we may have ran into is that the deans may have said, why am I gonna grow research? It's too expensive. You know, why, why would we do this? We're not bringing enough money. Well, what we did was we said, okay, we're gonna take 20% of the undergraduate net tuition, face-to-face -face only, uh, this excludes 
uh, online tuition, take it off the top, and then allocate it back to all the schools and colleges based on their three-year average of their sponsored revenue. And by doing that, again, it's explicit. All the deans can see you know, who's doing research, how they're getting that allocation, but it also incentivizes the deans because they know if they're not collecting the full indirects, um, they are receiving undergraduate tuition to help cover the cost. It also ha uh, helps the deans understand the indirects a little more. And, and they need to start balancing trying to get full indirects versus a lot of foundation grants that don't have any indirects. And I know we already have some deans saying, okay, this foundation won't pay any indirects, but they're gonna pay rent, apparently. So let's go after them and try to get, rent, get them to pay rent. So it's, it's just kind of getting people to think a little more strategically when they're going after some of these, um, some of these grants, which are, again, it's a strategic priority and we want to grow research as much as possible. Um, any questions on this slide before I move forward? This was uh, one of the questions, hopefully we answered it. Eileen. Can you talk a little bit more about how uh, you're allocating the research and incentives? The, the research allocation, how is that uh, calculated? So once we have the, the pool of funds, so we, we do a projection on undergraduate tuition revenue and we take that net number and then we take 20% off the top. And then we, we give that amount back to the schools and colleges based on a three-year average. So for example, if, if uh, School of Biomed had 20% of the sponsored uh, revenue over the last three years, you receive 20% of, um, of that revenue, which then helps offset your bottom line, the targets that JB was talking about. Yes? It's part of your revenue. It's part of the big picture of the revenue. It's only at the school or college level. It's not down to the department level, but it's part of your revenue. But just, you have to also consider that you now have additional costs associated with um, running your operation in the RCM model. For example, you have this additional revenue, but now you're also allocated a portion of the uh, research administration office. So these are the things that you wanna take into consideration uh, when looking at the cost. So it does help your revenue target, but I wouldn't necessarily say that there's money sitting there, but it, it, when you start growing your revenue, you'll understand that you're growing the pot to then do more. It's, it's identified. No, it's completely, it's identified. There's a line item in there in the RCM model and it's a revenue source. But how you're spending that is your budget. Uh, an actual account number, it's in a, it's basically, it's in the model. Um, Eileen can actually right. see it in it, the RCM. In web budget, you can see it. It's distributed in web budget, and your administrators are, gonna, are going to then apply it to the right funds. But they can see it. So when you, yeah. when you look at the total picture for the schools or colleges, you see research allocation, and you see that amount in there. Again, we don't, we don't get too deep into how each administrator runs their operation. We can make sure and show them that the money's there, and at that point, how the dean and the administrator work with you is, is within your, your unit. So, so this actually, um, if we increase our research, we're going to be more last year. Correct. Year Correct. It's an incentive. It's right? an incentive. It helps, it helps you support the, the growth. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the expectation that that 20% is going to be used to well that Yes. You're right. You're absolutely right. Correct. Yes, sir. Well, one of the main reasons was at the time that we were doing this, that was the funding source. It was the undergraduate um, tuition revenue that was going to support this. Um, we decided to keep it that same way in the model um, and there, there's various reasons. I mean, when you talk about online, you know, some deans may argue, well, the online students aren't involved with research as much. The, uh, the graduate tuition revenue was a smaller amount. You know, we're, we're a tuition-driven university, and at the time, the largest portion of our tuition was undergraduate tuition. Um, we're talking about growing graduate now, which is a good thing, but this is another incentive to grow graduate 
because you're not having the 20% come off the top either, as opposed to the undergraduates. So that, that was the thinking behind it at the time. Okay. All right, this, uh, here we're trying to answer another question. Um, somebody asked, what is the driver for the Vice Provost of Research Office, as well as the, which includes research administration, everything that Alistair just talked about, all the changes that are being made. So what we use in the model is we take their budget, which isn't enough, of course, it's never enough, right? <laughs> and we allocate that back to all the schools and colleges, again, based on that same driver, a three-year uh, sponsored revenue uh, average is how it goes, is allocated back to all the schools and colleges. So we're trying to tie all those things together. You know, as you grow your research, you're getting additional uh, undergraduate tuition, um, you're also getting an allocation from um, the Vice Provost for Research uh, to your call center. And, and people say, well, how am I ever going to get ahead? Well, the one thing that we're doing with the ANS committee is to try to keep the cost of all administrative units at the university down. So as the revenue grows, um, the primary units will see the benefits and that the ANS costs become more efficient. I mean, that's really the goal, um, one of the goals with RCM. Any questions on that one? Um, uh, here's another one where people were asking, well, how do we, why do we have to budget the grant expenditures for a fiscal year when um, there's a project deed? And we know how much, you know, the, the funding, how much the funding is. We know how long it takes to spend the money. Why do we have to do it based on a fiscal year? The main reason for that, and there's a couple reasons, but the main one is to determine the indirect rate and the ind indirect revenue that's coming in, the actual revenue that you're projecting to come in in a given fiscal year. And again, that revenue that's coming in in that fiscal year is helping the colleges hit their target. So if they're bringing in, you know, 10 million of sponsored revenue and 2 million in directs, uh, or they're gonna spend, let's say they're gonna spend 10 million of uh, sponsored uh, activities and 2 million in directs, those indirects are going to offset uh, the cost to run the operation, um, whether it's EPR, or lab space, all those things, as well as the 20% allocation. So um, that's, that's the, really the main reason why we need all of you to do your best guess at the projections. And here are some guidelines that we're putting out there. Obviously, as we get closer to budgeting for fiscal year 18, so we're really getting ahead of the game. We're just wrapping up 17 today. Web budget closes today for 17. For 18, just so all of you know, we're gonna start this process earlier than this year. We're gonna start in the fall. Um, for projecting for 18. So when your finance administrators and your schools and colleges come to you and say we need projections, they really do need projections. <laughs> so um, please work with us on all that. Here's some guidelines here. There's, there's some reports that Patty Russo's area has created. Uh, here's the link, most of you should have that. Um, those reports should give you historical data related to your revenue, um, your indirects and your directs and your expenditures. Um, hopefully you can use that and then you look at um, current proposals in COEUS and everything should be in COEUS now. We shouldn't have anything outside of COEUS, right? So you would want to look at that and then you would want to give us uh, your best guess at your uh, uh, direct, indirect revenue and expenses. Um, and so hopefully, uh, hopefully we come up with a number that will then help the dean be able to determine uh, what the true costs are to run the operation within the college. And that's it. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom and JB. That was really great. And I know it's a Tremendously busy time for you, so we really appreciate you both coming out and educating this group. Um, I'm, I'm just having okay. an issue getting back the okay. because the, 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 <laughs> At least um, we're consistent. The mouse pad is not functioning appropriately, so. So as part of our invitation process, uh, we solicited questions, research questions from the community. And uh, we received 54 unique questions spanning 11 different topic areas. So for the first part of this Q&A session, Claire and I are going to uh, ask our panelists questions received in advance. 
Uh, we then hope to have a short uh, follow-up question period from the audience, but um, we don't know if time will allow. We've sort of, you know, eaten up any cushion that we've had. So um, we welcome you to discuss any lingering questions with our panelists at the reception that will follow. And we also welcome you to uh, reach out to Claire and I if you have questions, reach out to the panelists. We can uh, post follow-up questions on the SharePoint site. So if you have any questions that need to be addressed that weren't addressed today, SharePoint will be the place that you can find your answers. And um, so um, at this time, I'd like to introduce the panelists, and we're going to call them up alphabetically. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Evelyn Balabas, the Executive Director of Research Accounting Services. <laughs> and Sue Evelyn. Jennings, Executive Director, HR Technology and HRIS. Stasha Levy, Executive Director, Pre-Award. Catherine Matak, Associate Vice President for Core Enterprise Systems, IRT. Jack Mendendorf, Executive Director, HR uh, at Human uh, Research Protection. Tom Quinn, Vice Provost, Administration and Finance. Anna Rivera, Associate Vice President and Controller. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that, that's no, I'm sorry, Director of Client Relations and Strategic Resources. <laughs> you didn't know you got promoted, did you? <laughs> Patty Russo, Associate Vice President and Controller. Maureen Way, Director of Research Competency Center. And last but not least, Kyrie Williams, Executive Director, Research Operations and Compliance. Just want to say, please be mindful that we have allocated 60 minutes for this portion of the program and that we have many questions to get through. It is important to remember that we are one university and need to have a collegial conversation about how we can work together to solve complex issues that we are facing. Please hold your questions and comments till the end. And if we don't get to you, please submit your follow-up questions on the three by five cards that we distributed at the registration table, and we will work to get the responses posted on SharePoint soon after the presentation. Okay, so I think I'll get started. We both have stacks of questions, and we tried to have them in a uh, have them well distributed. Um, some of the questions are, are going to be quickly answered. Some may take a little more. So um, we'll just try to keep the, the pace going so we can get through a lot of these questions from the community. So Susan Jennings, you're up first. <laughs> this is gonna be like uh, Jeopardy. <laughs> Susan, how do we ensure that background checks are not being charged to research funds, to sponsored research funds? Oh. <laughs> I think it slides out, Pat, in theory. I'm gonna yell, can you guys hear me? <laughs> is there an on? Is it working? It, it, it is, is working. working. Okay, I'm still going to hold it. This is kind of alien looking. <laughs> um, so to make sure that the background checks are not being charged to sponsored research, there's two ways that we find out that information. One is on Drexel Jobs and Drexel Med Jobs. There's a required field when you do the authorization to hire. To make sure you've got the code in there that is not on your research grant. And the second is on the authorization to hire forms. And on that, if you could just write in there in the comments, this is where you need to charge the background check, and we'll make sure we don't hit the codes that you don't want us to, to okay. hit on that. Great. That's Does that great. work? Yep. That works. Thank you. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Andrea for both of those answers. <laughs> <laughs> so this next question is for Patty Russo. Can we align the P-card setup practice with the new RAS policy for fund setup and access? <laughs> um, honestly, uh, Sue Jennings and I have been working uh, together to develop an enterprise systems access form. And as part of that form, our dream and vision of this is to have a one-stop shop where you can ask for all the access to all the various systems throughout the university. And with the help of the new Ask Drexel system, 
we will eventually route these requests to the various administrative areas using that tool. Initially, it will be a paper form that is in a, a final draft mode. Sue and I are meeting tomorrow to discuss what needs to be added. And it will be an evolution to get to something that is ultimately web-based, possibly. So, you know, the, the vision is to put it on the web, but certainly right now a form with paper is going to be the initial start with a move to Ash Drexel so that the transparency of where your ticket is and with what administrative department, you'll be able to see that as it moves through the areas. So I think that's going to be a real uh, innovation for mm -hmm. Drexel. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Anna Rivera. I've heard that in the future, stiffer penalties may be implemented for employees who use their P-card instead of smart source. Could you address this, please? Yes. So the short answer is yes, but the reason we're doing this is that procurement services is re-centralizing procurement from the decentralized model that we had previously. P-card, everyone was doing their own thing. But it's an encouragement for you to use the system that the university has spent uh, valuable resources on to implement, which is now called SmartSource, and the contracts reside in SmartSource, and it should be a much more efficient process for you to find your goods and services, your consumables, through the SmartSource system. So in an effort to help you re-centralize with us, yes, there will be stiffer penalties uh, per your instances of not complying with the new policies and procedures of the university. Um, so in the beginning, we'll be guiding you gently, but they will get stiffer pretty quickly, um, especially with things that we have in the system, such as Fisher Scientific, VWR. There really should be no need for you to use your P-card with the companies that we have in SmartSource. Thank you. OK, this next question is for Jack. Is there a way for research administrators in the college to have access to real-time reports on who in their respective colleges have completed various human subject certifications? Right now we have two different databases that we access. One is through our vendor, CITI, out of Miami. Uh, the second one is on a very old server here. That's the one that you took your old HIPAA training on and uh, your other safety trainings. There is not a central location that we can give you access to because to give you access to just yours would mean to give you access to everybody in the entire university. Uh, I did put an email out to CITI to see if there would be a, possibly a way that they can group by investigator or by coordinator people within their division and their trainings. I'm just waiting for them to get back to me on that. Uh, I could recommend you keep a cheat sheet with the CVs that you produce during your grant applications or your applications to the Western IRB if you're doing industry sponsored uh, and just keep your updated list there. This question is for Evelyn and may cross over to Catherine as well. So, Post Award recently stopped uploading copies of the Notice of Grant Award to COIUS. It is our understanding that this information is now stored in knowledge. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when did the change take place and, and how can we get, I guess this is where it crosses over to Evelyn, how can we as administrators get access to this information? Well, we are putting everything into knowledge now. That is our, our system of record, in a sense. Um, it interfaces with Banner, so that is the direction we're going in. At some point, we do want to have a read access to the campus community so that they, too, can see it. Um, you do get a copy of the award docs at the point of pre to post handoff. You're all, well, the department administrators, I believe, and the PIs are copied on that. So that's now the mechanism right now for you to have a copy for it. But yes, I mean, as soon as IRT is ready to move, we, you know, we'll be able to move it to knowledge and have access. Right. So the knowledge, the application needs to be structured so the documents are indexed properly and can be retrieved correctly. And then we just need to work with how to organize the data so it's securely displayed to those that need it and figure out also the best interface. Where are you when you need to see that data and can we interface with that application to show it to you right then? So those are some of the issues we need to work through to uh, uh, ideally streamline it. Mm -hmm. So in the interim, as department administrators, we don't have automatic access, you know, because if we weren't copied on the email at the, at the time of the award, um, would it, Evelyn, do we go to you or is that a pre or a post award issue if we need copies? 
I think um, most of the, co are you saying you're not getting it on the free to post kind of? No, not if we it? weren't Drexel employees at the time. You know, if it's an, if it's an old award. Or an old yeah. one. Okay, so if that does happen, yes, contact your, mm -hmm. your RAS accountant and mm -hmm. they would be able to go into knowledge and print out a copy for okay. you. This next question is for Stasha. If the PI is in another college and a co-I in my department is on a grant, how do I know if the grant was awarded so I can update the labor distribution? And I, this might also cross to Evelyn as well. Um, well, when an award is made, we contact the PI who is receiving the award and their department administrator if they have someone working with them. Um, and then from there, and, and then also our team would send out um, or reach out to the subcontractors from other institutions outside. But all of the internal uh, collaborators or other folks who are working on it or need to be involved, that would probably be something that actually we would suggest that your group maybe come up with a, an internal process for department administrators to cross information. Um, only because sometimes there are budgets with salaries and you know sensitive information that we wouldn't want to share between different departments, um, and so that may be something that your group mm -hmm. you know can advise us mm -hmm. even you know on how you mm -hmm. would like to handle it. Um, you know maybe one of the, the focus groups to come up with some solutions for that. Um, but right now it would be we would recommend that the awarding the awardee department. Uh, reach out to the other collaborating departments within Drexel to say we got our award and now this is what we need from you in order to get your folks paid or set up your budget if, if they're requesting that. Okay. Thanks. Well, we're going to follow up with that one because that's kind of an issue for us in Biomed too and we do need to figure out a better system to notify people that that's the case. Thank you, Sasha. Okay. I have a question for Maureen. In InfoReady Review, the new uh, system for uh, applying for internal funds, can we make available to departments and college administrators um, reports from that system? So unless you're running uh, a program in the system, we have, we in the departments have no way of knowing who from our college or department applied for such funds. Cur currently, InfoReady is not set up that mm -hmm. way. We're working with the people who are administering the, the competitions to see if there's a way we can do that. Mm -hmm. We've also worked with Patty and Evelyn on the setting up of the awards so that the, the departments, the, you know, the departments and the department administrators will be signing off before, like if you get an internal award, it will go through you before the award is accepted and set up in banner. But at the time of application right now, if the applicant adds, you know, add you, you will get all the notifications, mm -hmm. but the way the system is set up right now it is just, and it's a, it's a, the way InfoReady is set up, it's not Drexel's implementation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but we have heard that issue. And we're okay. Trying yeah. to <laughs> Thank you. do something. If there's a follow-up question, and you may have actually just answered it, but uh, proposal submissions for internally funded projects submitted via InfoReady <laughs> allow investigators to commit resources such as lab space and personnel without the benefit of review at the college or department level. Are there plans to change this in the future? So you're saying that not necessarily at the application phase, but before the award phase, before the everyone award. involved would yes. have to yes, sign off. Yes, because when you accept the award is when you've really made the commitment. Okay. So, and I think uh, Patty sent out an email probably two weeks ago mm -hmm. that has the new forms, that has the new procedures. Mm -hmm. So it probably was before this question was asked. Mm -hmm. But if you review, you know, what's out there and you have more additional questions, please let us know. Great. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Sue. I heard that very soon there will be salary reports available through Web Finance. Can you tell us when they are expected to be released and who will be able to access them? I had to give Catherine a heads up on this because I'm going to throw her under the bus a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this has been in testing for a while. Unfortunately, IRT has been slammed with a lot of unplanned projects right now, and this is just not ready for rollout. But we are in the process of testing it. And it will, the report set out, the, the new report is going to be the labor allocation report, and it's of all current active faculty and staff associated with the salary dollars distributed to the home organization. So it's going to be something very similar to roster on web salary for who has access. Did I get it right? Good. Should have some resources freed up, and um, we're shooting for mid-April for this to be finalized and signed off on. If everything goes well. 
I, ju I just have a quick follow up because I, I know that I was actually in on some of those planning meetings. Is there going to be available to us the two reports that we were talking about? The one was the roster and the other one was fund specific so we could see the external uh, salaries on the, on the uh, grant funds. Are you talking about the reports that were coming out of HRIS? Yes. Okay, that was another question. That's a different one. I just okay. want to point that out. <laughs> that is a different one. Awesome. Uh, the two reports that she was referring to are actually have been created by Franny in our office. And to get access to those, you'll need to contact me. So let me know if you want that. You need to have Hyperion access before that can occur. I'm assuming most of you have Hyperion access. And we've decided to take kind of a shortcut on security. If you have access to the information already approved on web salary, then we're going to approve access for the same thing because it's basically the same information. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sorry to change up questions. Mr. Yeah, you're getting sneaky. Over <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a question for Evelyn and, and maybe even Patty. Um, as departmental administrators, we work directly with the Office of Research to support faculty in our respective units. Requests to RAS often get backlogged and in some instances can take months to be processed. There is no doubt that RAS staff are working very hard, but the problem is generally viewed by the community as having a simple fix. RAS needs to hire additional staff. Is RAS understaffed? And if not, what is an appropriate response we can give our faculty and administration who want to understand the reasons for the backlog? I'll always take more people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we're understaffed today because we are at a very manual process. You know, we don't have the systems integrated, we don't have the automation. So for all the things that we're doing today, they're manual processes. So yes, for today we're understaffed. But once we get the billing module in, once we get the effort reporting in, once we get the wonderful upload tool that uh, Miguel has created, once those things are in, I believe when thing, our processes are streamlined that we will be right staffed. You know, I, I think today we do suffer. And, you know, if you aren't getting responses, then I do want to know. So email me. Um, but I think that's really more the issue, that once we get everything else in place, we'll be in a better place. I, I totally agree with that response. And I think Alistair also has mentioned that as part of his C-Ray update that you know, we're right staff now. The last thing that I want to do is bring staff in on a temporary basis and in three months have to let people go. That is not our objective in any way, shape, or form. We are trying to, it is a short-term problem, and when this billing module goes live, it will solve a lot of the problems that currently exist in this office. And I have dedicated my Saturdays, as well as Miguel Abreu's, to committing to that project. So it will be live. So I, I think we are at a point where people need to see a product. You will see a product called labor redistribution with HRIS and effort reporting in the April timeframe. You will see a journal entry workflow in the April timeframe. And you will see a grant billing module in the summer of 2016. You will definitely have enough to play with for the summer months. <laughs> so, so the next rogue all hands, we can talk about what you liked and disliked about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if it's on. There we go. Uh, just one little point with the uh, the integrations and the streamlining. Uh, part of the process before the systems that we have can integrate is the business processes have to be clearly defined. And that's what a lot of time has been spent by a lot of people to make sure that the rules are understood and properly reflect how Drexel does its business so then we can hopefully uh, integrate the systems to make it make sense and work uh, effectively. So this next question is for Jack. Are there plans to reinstate more of the services that the formal clinical research group offered? If similar services are currently being offered, they haven't been advertised. Can you speak about this? Uh, when the Office of Research originally took over uh, components of the clinical research support services, we initially took over the staff member themselves. Uh, St. Christopher's, we have a clinical research coordinator and a research nurse. Here at Drexel College of Medicine, we have a, uh, two research coordinators and we also have a research nurse manager. Uh, in the interim, starting I believe it was this past April of 15, we reinstated the monthly training and education meetings. 
Uh, later, we started lunches back up, so we could hopefully uh, encourage more people to come out for our uh, training. We uh, introduced a new CTMS system here so that we would be in line with the one used by the tenant healthcare system. We had been using one called eMERGE. Tenant healthcare was moving over to one called Clinical Conductor. So we worked with tenant and their vendor, and we agreed that we liked the product that they had. We were able to come under with the tenant pricing, pro pricing rather. So we adopted the Clinical Conductor CTMS system as well. That's handled by the office. Our initial contract was for 30 trials to get started. We have now met 25 protocols that are within the new conductor that are what we call green. That means they are active. Of those 25 protocols, 28 subjects have been enrolled. Two invoices have been released out to the sponsor to recover startup fees. There is also another position that has been posted to support the CTMS system to assure billing compliance, to make sure that we're billing on behalf of research and we're not billing to any of the third-party payers or CMS, things of that nature. Um, what else I got on my cheat sheet? Mm -hmm. One second. Okay, and ClinCard came out. ClinCard is our debit payment system for when you are enrolling subjects in research. When your payments will be $20 or more in, in fees to them, you can contact our office and Daryl Spruill, our research nurse manager, will hook you up with the debit card system. Right now we're using it for clinical trials only. Um, we started it about eight months ago. It's been going pretty well so far. Uh, basically, it's like your MAC card for subjects that are in research. They come in, they do an activity, they get a payment, and instead of having to worry about tracking down cash, check, you give them a debit card, you enter into your PC how much they're to get on that account, and it revives it for them. They come back in six months or their next visit, whatever it may be, and you give them their next visit on it. Uh, but right now we've only extended it to the sponsored clinical trials. We have a constant source of income coming because there are fees and incidental costs associated with that. Okay. Question for Stasha. Thank you, Jack. With the new Smartsheet subrecipient commitment form, how will department administrators be able to track if the form has been completed and relay this back to the, the appropriate COIUS record? This new process uh, appears that it could slow down the pre-award activity, especially in light of the three-day rule. So I'll refer back to Alistair's presentation with the car that was on two wheels and they were changing <laughs> tires at the same time. <laughs> the subrecipient monitoring, uh, as many of you know, is a requirement, uh, has been a long-standing requirement, but lots of changes uh, to the policy, to the um, regulations and the requirements uh, were made with the uniform guidance um, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, so we are, have been working on this for a while, for a year, and trying to catch up and make sure that we're compliant, not just with collection of information with this form, uh, which this form uh, addresses, <coughs> collecting the information from the subs that we need so that they can be on the proposal, but even through the life of the award, um, our own auditing for our A133 uh, needs information from the subcontractors that we do make the awards to. Um, so this form is just part of an overall process and policy. Um, our website has been recently updated with a page um, for s the subrecipient monitoring policy, procedures, guidelines, forms, and links. Um, it's under the compliance section. It has its own subpage under there, so I welcome you to take a look at that. But in terms of the form itself, um, the process, uh, like I said, is, is kind of still in development. We have a few people, a few people in your group and obviously in our office, looking at it, vetting it carefully. Um, we've had some responses, people using, subcontractors using the form. Um, which automates filling in a database that, again, will be used, um, you know, on the post award side and the auditing side. Um, so we, we definitely don't want this to be burdensome for anyone, for the, you guys as department administrators, for your PIs, if they are PIs who don't have um, help in the departments, and certainly not for the subcontracting institutions. But it is an overall process that affects many things. Um, it's something that we've committed to, um, and so we do want your feedback as far as you know, what may become difficult. The process as it stands now is if you send the link to the form to the subcontractor, they fill in all their information and upload their attachments. When they click submit, it automatically populates a smart sheet database and it generates an email that goes to an email account that my team has access to. When you send the email to the subcontracting institution, the guidelines that are now on our website, we're going to be sending an announcement out and it'll also be in our newsletter that'll go out next week. 
if you copy your pre-award administrator, they'll know to keep an eye out for that notification email that the sub has completed all of their information. And as soon as it comes in, they'll be able to forward it to you or to your PI or both, so that not only are you aware that the subcontractor submitted all of their information, but the attachments and all the data will be available in the body of the email, so then you have a copy of that as well. There may be some back and forth if changes are needed. Again, we're still working on that process. Um, but our intention is to notify you as soon as possible um, so that you're informed of when that information comes in. But again, it is a process that we're developing or working on, and we're more than open to the feedback that you have and suggestions that you have um, for how we can tighten things up and, and make it efficient. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, this, this is a two-part question, and actually the first part is for Catherine, and then the second part is going to be for Kyrie, Maureen, and Evelyn. Biggie. The first part for <laughs> Catherine. I know. Complicated, it's right? Complicated. Uh, when will a transition be made to a ticket based system for inquiries to the Office of Research? So, we have a tool that's being used by the university, um, which I call right now, uh, but it's a Oracle. Uh, an Oracle product, they've uh, bought it, and uh, it's been branded Ask Drexel. Um, it's being set up, we've been working with uh, uh, management and to uh, categorize uh, the information, the questions that typically people get uh, in order to route them properly. So we've been working uh, at a high level to try to define those buckets and that information and organize it that piece is just about done, and then what we want to do is take it and introduce it uh, n the next level down and have everyone uh, do a run through and see if we've caught everything and if the, the cues and the routing for incidents and for questions make sense and, um, and for collaboration for those questions. Um, so the tool's here, it's in place, we're setting it up, and then I'll, I'll pass it off to the folks that know a little bit more details. So, so the, so the follow-up question, there's actually a second part of the question that I'm going to address to Kyrie, Maureen, and Evelyn, related to the upcoming ticketing system, which we're really excited about. What processes will be put in place to ensure that tickets are addressed in a timely fashion? The management has not seen the, the full test site yet. Those are scheduled for next week and the following week. Um, it has, like Catherine said, basically our, um, you know, what we think the questions will be. After that, we will have the staff come in and take a look at it. And it's, you know, if you've used these things, like with your credit cards, and you go and you, and you pick a question, the technology is very easy, but the learning curve with something like this is very great. So. Even when it's up and running, we're going to have a transition time where we don't want to slow the staff down any further than they are already burdened. So we're going to have to kind of, um, you know, see how it goes. What could, because we will still have to figure out what goes through um, Ask Drexel and what goes through, you know, you'll still have your relationship with your pre-award and your post-award, which are extremely important. So there will be stuff that goes through Ask Drexel, there will be things that don't, and we're going to have to um, work that out. And, you know, we're getting towards closing, so as much as we're almost ready to start doing it, it's not necessarily a quick implementation. We have a couple of administrative areas ahead of us that have just started to implement, you'll probably be hearing about that soon, and, um, and they know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> So, it is, I mean, it, it really is, and, and eventually, I can speak for like Coe's help, which, you know, you've used that, something like that, where there's a group email that you're using now, it's easy to transition over to Ask Drexel, um, because we'll just forward the questions there, and we'll be able to, to answer them. Um, as far as escalation of tickets, the primary hope is that once this is up and running, where you're going to get that escalation the most is... It's going to allow the Office of Research to look at what questions are getting asked and, you know, where do we need more training? Where do we need either training of the staff or training of the department administrators? It's going to allow us to identify problems a lot sooner. You know, there's issues that some people call me, some people call Nadine, some people call their pre-award or post-award. We'll be able to look at this and see, like, something that I see, oh, one or two questions on, 
you know, there could be 25 questions and I don't know it because I'm only getting one or two. So it's really going to help us sort out um, where, where are the areas that we can provide training or, you know, prioritize things and where are the workload stoppages that, that are causing the emails not to be answered. So I think, I think in the long run that's what's going to happen. But I'm just cautioning you because of closing and all the other changes that we're trying to implement, it probably, you know, probably won't be till fall where it's really fully out there live. Um, but that doesn't mean there's a lot of work that we go into. And it's very it's suggested to pilot uh, the, the application. And so a, a group that's already got a strong kind of structure in place will probably be one of the first people to see it because it aligns nicely and uh, we can make sure to tweak the reports, the dashboards that are available, and the escalations that can happen within the application. So if a response is not answered, it turns different colors, other people are alerted and stuff like that. But one of the strong features definitely is you get a view across the system of questions that are being asked and, uh, and then it, it waits, like it, it, it pops up, if you will, and so you can immediately go, you know what, we need to write an FAQ, or we've got one out there and it's just confusing because we keep getting all these follow-up questions. So it really uh, adds to some effectiveness that way. Yes, and I think internally, just with you know, following from the RCM presentation and service level agreements, uh, having a system that actually provides metrics for how many inquiries the various offices are getting, uh, Alistair and myself and all the management of the Office of Research will be able to see how many tickets are being channeled there and, and see how timely they're being responded to. So we'll be able to gauge that. And, and for the one group that is actually going live now, I, I've actually been in it for, for the areas that's about, you'll get an announcement shortly. But it's, it's a good tool just to see what your group is being faced with. So to, to have that insight is powerful. Yes, Alistair. I think one of the things that is challenging for us is, you know, what we offer to you is often a black box to you, it's a black box to us too, and trying to manage this. So this is really going to give us insight to our operations and procedures that we haven't had until now. So we're really looking forward to it for multiple reasons. Great, thank you. We're excited about that as well, so I think it'll be yes. great. Uh, I have a question for Kyrie. Um, can you offer training for faculty members in the area of export control and ITAR? In general, it seems that these concepts are not very well understood by faculty. Yes, yes, we can do that. Actually, about, um, about a year ago when I took over export controls, um, you know, one of the things I knew was that it wasn't an area that the university um, knew a lot about. Um, and with the many compliance areas, I always think the first step to uh, overcoming it or mitigating those risks related to those compliance is awareness, right, and training um, and educating people on the risk out there and the risk they face in conducting their research. So we actually, and I'd say we, I'll give the credit to Caitlin McCormick who works for me, she put together five initial trainings um, based on different levels, so from introductory to more about international shipping. If you want to know about foreign visitors visiting your lab and those risks, we have those there. If you go to our export control website, um, right on the right hand side through SharePoint, you can uh, request. We give periodic ones monthly, um, but what I really like is that uh, there's a, a custom request form. So if you go there and you can say, hey, I have a specific concern, maybe I don't want this introductory, um, introductory or I don't wanna know about shipping, you have a specific issue, we can build a training for you, or we can just generally just come and talk to you about different issues and activities that relate to export. Um, I appreciate this comment because nobody normally ever wants to talk about export <laughs> controls. So we would, we would welcome we would welcome that. Um, you know, we have an export control at Drexel.edu email address. Feel free to email myself, kdw38 at Drexel.edu. Um, you can find it all on the website. Great, thank you. So this next question is for Evelyn. What new processes are being put in place to mitigate late financial reports to sponsors? So late financial reports right now, it is a manual process and we basically, for the federal awards, we go to their website and we pull it down and see what's outstanding. 
as we get this grants billing module that's coming in, it actually will track financial reports also. So we'll be able to have a tracking system for the financial reports that are due. So upon set up in the system, it will now give us a reminder and we'll be able to then know when a financial report is due. So it should get improved with that because it is very manual right now. I just want to add so that your expectations are not only My priority is the billing system and events related to billing. Reporting events will follow after the billing system is implemented. So don't think that on July 1st, you're gonna have every reporting event in place. We need to address the billing first. That's the money. I just wanna share with you that we totally support you in getting the billing automated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Stasha. Uh, could you tell us what elements are being reviewed during the first pre-award check in COIUS? Uh, the current review process appears subjective uh, and can be causing some of the delays with the three-day rule. So because my team does this, I, I got some information from them, so Great. I use my cheat sheet this time. Uh, the items that are reviewed at the first pre-award check are that all the required forms are uploaded and completed, such as the FCOI, the abstract, the budget justification. The budget will be checked for compliance with the sponsor and Drexel's guidelines, as well as salary confirmation. Each tab will also be checked to be sure that all of the information has been properly completed, such as the general tab has the correct sponsor and due dates, the credit split is completed correctly, the solicitation has been included, or if there is IDC or cost sharing, uh, proper justification and documentation has been added, um, and that the export controls section lists all the personnel on the project. Um, and then you said about because the because there are two pre-award reviews. There's oh, one in earlier in the stage, and then there's one later in the stage. And sometimes proposals get stuck at that early phase. So we okay. were just wondering what the trade-off is: time okay. versus right. You know, so those are, those are that's kind of the more general. While mm -hmm. usually while the scientific stuff mm -hmm. and the, the technical pieces are being worked on, or maybe mm -hmm. even the subcontractors are getting more information and mm -hmm. from collaborators. Um, but the baseline things that need to be in COIUS in order for the approvals to go through mm -hmm. so that we don't have to come back later to ask for information, that's the first level mm -hmm. check. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to think about maybe streamlining that and have one Well, you review? know, we, we have changed, I think since mm -hmm. the inception of COIUS, we have changed the routing a number mm -hmm. of times to respond to feedback from the community or changes mm -hmm. in our process or even with the deadline. So it's certainly something that we're open to considering. Okay. Um, as you know, many of you know, COIUS is, uh, on, on its last legs of for a bit um, or not being supported on that for much longer. So we're going to be looking at new products. Um, and so certainly the conversations about routing and mm -hmm. how many reviews there are, right. you know, it's a great time to start having that. Great. Thanks. Um, this next question I'm going to share with not only Evelyn, but also Patty. Um, the financial management of clinical trials is an ongoing challenge. What changes are being implemented to ensure that clinical trial accounts are set up correctly so that web finance balances reflect the actual activity of a trial? <laughs> Don't all rush to the microphone. <laughs> by research accounting. But research accounting is not aware sometimes of things that are actually services that are really billed for unless we're told by a clinical coordinator what the billing is. And we had a recent internal audit of the clinical trials area and this was actually put on a, a sort of a, a later burner just a, in the in terms of the accounting because in reality, we really should be doing accrual accounting for clinical trials. And right now, it's more of a cash-based accounting, which is why you cannot understand what you have and what you don't have. So after we get through the billing module, then I will begin to address the clinical trials billing, okay? Patience is a virtue. The size and scale of the clinical trials billing is 1% of the whole. So you need to put in perspective, all those that have these things may feel that this is very painful, but when I'm talking about $110 million, and this is only 1% of that amount, this is not my highest priority, okay? I need to make sure that we collect 
the 109 million. <laughs> I have a question for Anna. What processes are in place to troubleshoot ordering through SmartSource to minimize problems with order delivery, shipment tracking, shipment tracking, payments, and payments? And payments. So it's, that's a multi-part question. It's like everything. Question. Everything. Right. <laughs> right. I've got a half hour to answer this one. Right. To troubleshoot ordering. So, uh, of course, we have our hotline. As for Cure, you can email them or you can call the hotline, 215-895-2876. <laughs> um, there are, uh, we are also going to be implementing Ask Drexel as well. I think we get to go first. Yay. And so uh, we will be also be able to track what we really appreciate about Ask for Cure is going, uh, or now Ask Drexel. But for us, it'll still be Ask for Cure. We're going to start directing all of your questions to them. Because there will be a dashboard. Uh, for us to see as well as research what are the hot topics where we also need internal training and external training and to make more efficient processes. So we're working towards that particular thing. So what's in place right now is that we have a dedicated staff of people to help you answer your problem questions. There are resources inside of SmartSource itself for you if you're a do-it-yourselfer. There's some stuff on the left side of SmartSource to help you answer your frequently asked questions and some tools for you. And uh, we put out more every day uh, as we find uh, places we need some tweaking. Uh, you also have an entire team of people that report to me, your client relations category managers, and if you're not sure who they are, you will soon know them by name. Uh, we have a full complement of them now. But there is a uh, resource on the procurement page to help you uh, find your client relations category manager. And you can just call them and say, hey, I need help with this. And uh, they will walk you through the system. They'll help you look for an order. As far as automation is concerned from the vendors, at, the, at this time, really, the catalog vendors are the only ones who are going to send you a reply or a confirmation about your order. Uh, the, I would say that all of them, with maybe the exception of one company, automates a, a confirmation back to the requester. So make sure you're the requester if you're the person that needs to know this. I know that Fisher does it. I'm quite positive that CDWG does it because I got like 14 emails the other day when I ordered something small. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, you can also check on order status in some of the catalogs. Not all of them have the um, ability to let you check order status within their systems, but the most sophisticated of them do have the ability to let you like track your order just, uh, just like Amazon.com does, like, hey, where's my stuff, and give you the tracking number. Um, but every day, um, SmartSource and the people behind SmartSource develop uh, more and more tools to automate everything within the system and we are getting better and better at automating the processes within our office. Um, hopefully I've helped on well, most yep. of the answer there. <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions for Maureen? Is it possible to get a report in Hyperion that shows all the pertinent information in the grant setup screen fragrant? Project start date, uh, uh, for example, project start date, end date, budget start date, end date, current obligated amount, cumulative obligated amount, and anticipated amount. Um, yes, it is. And the report is actually out in the research community folder on Hyperion. When the reports were recently released, all the fields were not there. Um, due to requests like this, the report was re-released. I don't remember exactly when. <laughs> um, the one piece that's not out there yet because we're still reviewing is the obligated versus cumulative obligated versus anticipated because as everybody probably knows, we have not been consistent in how we record those either in COIUS or in Banner. And so we're trying to at least make sure that we can, if we put that information out there, that we can at least tell you the pitfalls if we can't fix them before we give you the information. So um, 
you know, that one might be, you know, that one might be a little bit while it coming. But if you go back, if you've used those reports and the fields weren't there before, um, I know Miguel did go back and add them all and the, the report still has the same title. He just added them to the current reports. They're actually embedded inside the report. So there's like three separate queries within the Hyperion report that give you three different snapshots of the reports. And the link that Tom and JB presented to you earlier is the description of the reports. So if you don't have access to the Hyperion reports, you want to email FCC, and that's not for the Federal Communications <laughs> Commission. That would be the Finance Competency Center at Drexel.edu, and Miguel will work with IRT to get you the appropriate access to the research community folder in which these reports are housed. They have been out there for nine months. Okay. <laughs> Catherine, I heard that a Hyperion is going to be re replaced by a new reporting system. Can you tell us what the name is and when you expect it to be rolled out? Sure. So, indeed, uh, Hyperion is being replaced. It's being deprecated by Oracle. Um, we've purchased uh, the, the, the next uh, level of the Oracle reporting solution, and I call it OBI, which is Oracle Business Intelligent Enterprise sweet, they don't say the S, it's silent. Um, <laughs> it's, it's more sophisticated that way. So, <laughs> um, we're in the process of implementing it. Um, we uh, have been working um, diligently with Oracle um, and uh, a consulting firm to get it implemented um, and uh, have it uh, pretty much stable in the development environment um, and are working on the other two environments. We internally need some training to make sure that we know how to use it and set it up with the security and the permissions and that will be happening shortly and then the next step will be uh, bringing in the, 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 I guess, the key report writers that are the, the folks that develop those Hyperion reports for you and get training there. Um, my goal is, um, because we all have lots of hats that we wear and many projects and, and uh, priorities, to focus on um, uh, research is one of the first, so it'll be uh, accounts receivable. SCDC, Steinbright's got some needs that uh, uh, don't exist in Hyperion, so that's a good place to start. And then uh, research, because uh, though many reports have been being developed, there's a lot more to go, um, and so it's a good area. The other areas that exist that already have a lot of strong reports, this isn't portable, and it's a great time to take a look at the many reports we have out there and go, why? Why do we have this report? Um, and rework them and do some spring cleaning. Um, so I hope to start uh, uh, with some strong focus. Um, I'm trying to think what month this is. Um, in, in early May. May, so I'll speak. But uh, <laughs> but the uh, we're actually looking to license a software that Miguel Abreu and I. Uh, developed at Temple, which is called the PI Checkbook, which is really meant for those people who are really not financial users. You know, they, they want to put it in layman's terms. How much money do I have? And in licensing that, so after we get past the billing module, we would look to install this as part of our portal and have this as another tool for the community uh, that would simplify some of the data in, in terms that the, you know, non-accountants can understand. And, uh, I think that'll really be a, a very helpful addition to the portfolio. For people who don't use it. She said the people who don't know Hyperion, would it make sense to learn it if you are going to replace it with another tool? The reports that were provided in Hyperion are pretty much reports that you just run. You don't have for the community, you don't have to know how to program a report. So it's, it's just more of a execution function. The people, like uh, I think what Catherine was trying to say is the people that build reports have to understand the new technology so that they can produce replicas of what you have today. So I would say yes. I would say if you're interested in getting information on your current finances, it's very little investment other than sending an email to get your permission set up because it's, they're, they're intuitive. So. so this next question is for Stasha. Are there plans to help facilitate automated creation of biosketches and current and pending support forms? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, currently, uh, one of the, when we instituted the um, three-day deadline, uh, we came up with a list of new services uh, that our team uh, were, could help, additional things that we could help uh, with faculty and department administrators as they were preparing their proposals and their documentation. And one of those things was assistance with biosketches. Now there's only so much we can do because we don't necessarily know off the top of our heads the publications and the education and thing like that. However, we've been working very closely and I, Beth was on the list, I'm not sure if she's here, but Beth Tenhave, hi, uh, from the libraries who is awesome um, and has worked with us really closely and come and done some demos. The libraries have a tool called faculty portfolios and I think Claire also listed um, some of the other uh, science and B and some of the other my, my bibliography, um, a number of tools and their websites are awesome where they are automated tools. It does require a little bit of work up front um, for the faculty to build a, por a, a profile, um, but the librarians actually was on their site before this. Um, they do have librarians that can help the faculty to build them. It will pull in everything from education to teaching activities to publications to research awards. Um, and then once all of that is built, which doesn't take forever, don't, I don't want to make it sound that way, um, but a little bit of investment up front, then it really is a click of a button um, and it's kept updated. It, it pulls from lots and lots of different systems. Um, so as far as the bio sketches, that is something that's currently available now. And if you contact either your pre-award administrator or the Drexel Libraries, uh, we can kind of shepherd you through that and help you through that. Or your faculty members. So just to, just to follow up on that, uh, do you know the name of the system and do you know if it's being uh, rolled out, the new system? The faculty profiles? Yes. The Covaris. Do we have somebody from the oh, library Covaris. here? Yeah, Covaris. Thank you. Covaris. Covaris. And it's been rolled out? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Call Beth. <laughs> I have a question for Maureen. I've heard that COEUS is going to be replaced. Could you tell us about the timeline for the selection of the new application and university rollout? And is it safe to assume that we are only exploring applications with seamless system-to-system -system capabilities? <laughs> yeah. Good question. <laughs> different systems issues that we had. And as both Alistair and Catherine pointed out, if a lot of the system issues are not necessarily the actual system, it's the data. So when you look at some of the issues, um, you know, Patty said they're cleaning up the banner codes. We're looking at COEUS if we want to, and if it's not COEUS, if it's the new um, application, if we want to work with IRT to have it feed over, we have to be able to say this code matches this, this code matches this, and you know this is the these are the proposals to bring over. These are the proposals that we're funded don't bring over. And in the current and it's just because of the way things were, the systems were not integrated at the beginning, and they've just kind of grown their own way. And um, so so we're working to make sure all those codes are are, are in there. So we will be having a. a I, th I think this question is more focused on the pre-award side, on the system-to-system -system capability, so that we can move away from typing in yes. forms and just having an automated system that will communicate with grants.gov. So we are certainly hoping that is that. We have a lot of needs, and so, you know, we have a list of what we need a pre-award, what we need for mm -hmm. human resource protection, what we need for compliance, what we need for export control. So, it's, it's going to be a balancing act. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it does appear that most of the systems will do that, mm -hmm. but I can tell you I was at the SRA conference a couple of weeks ago, and I went to a thing, and a lot of people are, are in the same place we are. It's, it's not just our systems aren't working, mm -hmm. we get them working, and then NIH comes up with new forms, and you're back to the mm -hmm. make sure you're coming over, and then there's a new edition of Adobe, and are they compatible? So, so there is a lot that goes into that, but we certainly hope that we can um, we can do system to system. We were trying, as some people know, we had a test group last summer to get Cubbies to work, um, but we have to get some of these other issues corrected. Before we can do system to system, we have to have the right data to feed the next system. Does that make sense? 
Kind of. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, this next question is for Anna. Are there plans for procurement to send wire transfer confirmations to the merchant? It's great that it's uploaded into SmartSource, but those confirmations have to get to the merchants, and they are not under the not under the current process. So currently, that process is handled in concert with our sister group, Treasury. A file is sent over the, to Treasury to send to the bank to make the wire transfers on our behalf. So the only documentation is being sent back to the requesting department. It is not an automated process, and as Patty said with hers, it is probably only 1% of the transactions that we do, and it's probably not the process we had looked at first. But thank you very much for the question. It is an area that we will now take a look at and see if there's a way that we can transfer that information to the vendors. So we'll put it on the project list. So it will be now. <laughs> Thanks. Patty, I have a question for you. <laughs> Is it possible for department administrators and financial managers to get access to Banner and Hyperion? Web finance is better than nothing, but it's not the best system if we want to effectively manage our funds. I love this question. <laughs> and that's a yes, and then another yes. So Catherine and I have uh, spoken about this, and we will be developing a role that will include some of the base query forms in the banner system and banner finance, and you will be able to request that role as part of our very fancy schmancy enterprise systems access form. So that will probably get introduced around that time. So I think, uh, you know, I have nothing against it. Catherine has nothing against it. We just have to create a role to put these various forms in, and then, of course, we would have to give you some sort of education on right. the form, correct? So mm -hmm. again, they're pretty intuitive, so I don't think many people would uh, have difficulty figuring out where to put the fund number, mm -hmm. you know. <coughs> so I think it, it, it would be more like a job aid could do the trick. Okay. Thanks. This is another one for Stasha. Can department administrators or financial managers receive notifications when signed agreements are uploaded into COIUS? Yes. <laughs> I would say they do. Well, let me say this. So when a signed agreement, if when it's fully executed, fully executed, all parties have signed it, that unless it's a sub-award that Drexel has issued out, any other signed agreement is our notice of award. So if it's a contract, you know, we're doing a project with Lockheed and everybody signed it, that is our award notice that then has to be handed off to Research Accounting Services so they can set up the fund number. So that document as part of the pre to post handoff is provided in an email to the PI and the department administrator. Um, so they have it for there. Now as far as the upload into COIUS, the, um, my team, the grants team and the uh, contracts team do upload the fully executed document to the negotiation module and some of you may not be familiar with that, but um, it, you can actually, tra they track the negotiation as it goes through from receipt, all the iterations back and forth and who was with at the time, and then and different copies of the document, and then the final one is uploaded. The PI, who is who is on that agreement, does have view access to all of those negotiations and the attachments. So you may not, with your login for COIUS, but the PI does. Um, so as far as them being uploaded to the award module, as Evelyn said, knowledge is now the system of record for the awards. Um, so, but to Maura's question, if you, you should have gotten it or your PI should have gotten it during the pre to post handoff, but if it predates you or you didn't get it and you're asking for an award, then you can ask your RAS analyst uh, for an active award document. So, so just as a follow up question, because this is, this is actually um, to you and Maureen, is there a possibility that the grants administrator and the departments can get access to see these negotiations so they can go back and check the, see the, see the progress of negotiations? Is there a possibility that that can happen? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. During the pre award, like a Once that's signed, say by Alistair, 
gets into the code, so we don't get notified that it got into the code. So not the actual contract? Exactly. A different still, document. It's still pre -written. We're going to be a sub at University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And we had, they sent me a sub-recipient commitment form that we have to get signed on our side so they can submit the actual R01. So Alistair signs off on the sub-recipient commitment form. It goes into CODIUS, but we don't get notified that it's in CODIUS. So then the prime's contacting us and saying, hey, where's that form? Where's that form? And if I don't go into CODIUS... Well, when the, when the sub-recipient commitment form is signed on our side, yeah. it has to go back to the subcontractor. Right, but she does it. And it, it, sometimes it gets so, uploaded and so, not to her. Well, then that should not happen. <laughs> so it should either be emailed from us directly to the sub with you copied or sent to you so that you can send it, not the sub, the, our prime sponsor. Okay, well, so if that does not happen, then you need to let, let me know. Okay. That would just be a training point, I think, or a reminder that we need to let our folks know. Okay. Sorry okay. I misunderstood. Thank you. Can I add one more thing? Yeah, sure. I, I had Bob Sullivan's voice in my head, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the question about the um, the reviews, uh, uh -huh. yeah. uh, the pre-award reviews yeah. and the routing. And again, this is something to think about as you guys are coming up with feedback for us and maybe for the new system. Um, if we waited until the second level mm -hmm. to do our review of everything, that would be after the PI, the co-investigators, the department administrators, the deans, the chairs, that everybody had signed off, and then we'd be rejecting it because right, it didn't have like a contract, a, a conflict of interest form that maybe compliance needs to review or something like that. We did that for a while, mm -hmm. and we would have to reject it because it would have to be fixed. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we, I believe, that's why we added an earlier level okay. so that that kind of stuff is, okay, that's good. Now you can add stuff that we, you know, like your state mm -hmm. report, we may not have right. that much of a comment on. Um, so, but again, what feedback is welcome, so just keep that in mind as you're, as you're thinking about suggesting changes. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so uh, we have a, an agenda to, to try to keep uh, so I think we, we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience, and then we can move move along. Uh, right? Actually, we have a little bit more time than you think, so we have okay. about 15 minutes, and 15. I was just going to okay. say to Martha, you just kicked us off into the audience question part of the period. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to queue up on either side if you want to ask a question, and Moira and I will do it for the next 15 minutes. And if we don't get to your question, please write it on a note card and leave it on the registration table and we'll, we'll yep. follow up yep. and we'll make sure there's an answer yep. given because the program was shortened. So at this time, if you're interested in asking the panel a question, line up on either side and we will bring a microphone to you. Or do we ask all questions? Come on up, George Ann. <laughs> So when you guys are trying to automate all these systems, is there a, are you guys looking to do something of the tracking from like once we receive the award and then to the fund set up so that we as the department administrators can see where it's at so we don't have to just keep emailing our post award administrator like, hey, just checking, can you tell me where this is? And that way we can track and see where it is so we can follow up with the person directly. This goes back to, again, Ask Drexel. So we currently have the account called fund, fund number at drexel.edu where the setup requests go to when they're, the pre to post handoff occurs. That will then be routed to Ask Drexel. So then you will be sort of part of the ticket. And that will be your transparency into the handoff. So I think that's really why we're so interested in, in getting that customer relationship tool online. We're kind of doing some of it manually right now. When I get a, a pre-to-post, pre-to-raz handoff, I'm actually um, maintaining a spreadsheet of when this fund number was assigned. Uh, then the actual um, research accounting accountants are going in when they're doing the different updates. So we're trying to just get metrics at this point so we get some idea of how many we're doing in a month, how many, you know, what the turnaround time is, where are the parts that are actually slowing the process down. So if I get a call, I can look on this spreadsheet and I know to go to that account and say, hey, where is this? What's the problem? What are you running into? So I'm hoping as Axe Drexel comes in that that takes away a lot of the manual process and we'll be able to look there. 
Any other questions at this time? So we're being asked now to go in at the, after the fully executed CTA is completed and, and do a budget revision. Um, however, we've never been able to set up a budget that's not exactly the same for every year. So maybe for the first three years we're seeing patients and then maybe the you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh year we're only doing telephone calls. So the difference between the budget, so the budget is never accurate. Anything that goes into COEUS from us is far from what we're actually going to get or what's going to go out. So if that's how they're going to be deciding our budgets and it's inaccurate, I mean, how, it just doesn't make any sense. So like every time we say, how can we do this? Like the last one I put in didn't copy for the seven years that we're doing it. So right now we have a budget for one year and we called and we asked and they said, well, maybe somebody will get back in touch with you. So right now I have a seven year budget, but in COEUS it's a one year budget. It says seven, this year two, three, four, five, six, and seven says zero. Where does it say zero? In the actual budget. When well, you say actual budget, that's not in COEUS. COEUS. No, it's in COEUS. So there are multiple years in COEUS, but yeah. only the first year has money in it. Right. And you can't put funding in the out years? No, and I can't decrease the amount. You can copy and make all seven years the same, but you can't do a decreasing yeah. amount. But then you can go that into each individual year and edit the years. And well, if, if you're having trouble with I think this is a yeah, yeah. So I think this is a good question for offline. Yeah, the truth. It yeah. sounds like it's a very specific issue. Or and nobody's been able to help. Okay, so we'll get you help. We have all the experts here, so we have we will get you help. My question is to Tom. <laughs> It's about RCM budgeting, uh, the research funds. When we're budgeting uh, the compensation in the um, expense section, the compensation and the operating um, categories, we had a little bit of a challenge uh, trying to figure it out. It was very manual. And it, it took poor Claire <laughs> probably days. Uh, and if Claire couldn't uh, get through it, um, I'm really uh, curious to learn how everybody else did that. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've been working with all the schools and colleges. I think everyone that's represented here, all the finance directors that are here, know that we've been coming out personally and talking to them. If you haven't seen Jesse and JB and myself in the last month, then you must have been under a rock because we've been out there visiting all the colleges so every college is doing it a little bit differently. I mean, some are budgeting at the grant level because their salary is tied to that, whereas others are zeroing out every single grant. Uh, and again, it's, it's budget. So it's not really tied to what you're actually going to spend in the system. This is a budget at the college level to determine how much you're going to bring in for sponsored research, how much you're going to spend, and how much uh, indirects are going to come in. So some people are using that generic phone number that we created. Um, obviously, when we start 18, we're going to take all the feedback from all the schools and colleges and figure out what's the best way to do it. Um, do we just give you the ability to um, put in a number without having to zero everything out? Because that was a lot of work for a lot of people that did zero out all the budgets of old, a lot of old funds too. So that's part of the uh, fun we have as well. Well, it, it, the problem wasn't zeroing out uh, the, the budget, but it was the uh, positions that we couldn't delete. Right. So I had to go through every research position one right. by one. So that's part of it too. I mean, we, we may want to just not load those position budgets and then give you the ability. That's one option. But some of the colleges, like College of Medicine, they do prefer to budget the exact grant because they have that information or they'll put in a generic fund number because they know what the expenses are going to be. So we have to work through that because we can, right now it's open to do whatever you want to do in the system, and if we don't load them, it's going to affect one. If we do load the budget, it's going to affect someone else. So we have to talk about it before fiscal year 18. Just, to, just to, to, to tag on the end of that, 
with the, the salary budgets that are out there, this is the, not being able to delete a position or a person it is not new to the redesigned um, web budget. That has always been the case. You have not been able to delete a position with a current incumbent in it, and that is by design. And it, so you're not going through and saying, you know what, I don't really like Andrea that much. We're going to not budget her for next year. So when time comes around, we can just get rid of her. Um, so that that's not that's not a new thing that happened out this year. So if you if you're having issues outside of that, um, you know, we'll I'll grab you offline. But that, I just wanted to explain that that's not new functionality. That is as design. Moira, this is the last question. Okay. We've got three minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, I just want to say I miss the days when the research office provided the service of delivering our departments that monthly financial report. I realize now there's some great uh, financial report information that we can go get through Hyperion, um, but I'm wondering, is there any way to get back to delivering that service of at least providing the departments that basic report? When I go into Hyperion and print that report, I'm confronted with a lot of information that I don't need, some duplicated information, and it doesn't necessarily print nicely for me, so. And I'm gonna to have to respond to that with a no. This is a self-service age of ad hoc reporting on an ad needed basis. We, as you've heard from the discussion, are already under-resourced in the current state, trying to keep above water with closing things out, getting bills invoiced. Our time is not best spent running a report on a monthly basis when it's available for you to do on a self-service basis. Can I follow up? Could we find some middle ground and perhaps the, the report that's out there now have a um, minimize have some a of print the print report instead yeah. of a pivot. Yeah, absolutely. That we could just I grab. Think technically, we need to I think we can adjust step. the self-service report. If there's some exactly. function that's not doing what you've expected it to do, yeah. then you need to let us know that so yeah. we can amend it but we aren't going to run a report and email it to the community. No, That's right. just not going to happen. Okay, understood. Well, like I say, I miss those days. <laughs> Thank you. So, the, what Patty's saying is the information is available, it's just not being delivered <laughs> to your inbox, right? So that's, that's essentially it. You're getting the same information, it's just not being sent to your inbox. So what we can look into following the meeting. Well, that's, well, that's a follow-up. So, yeah. so I think what we would want to explore, right now, Hyperion does not have the capacity to do the scheduling of a report, but I would hope that when we move to the new OBIE, mm -hmm. that we could provide you with instructions on how to set up a report to schedule for you so that it would come to your inbox or push it to you somewhere and you could go online and retrieve it. You know, I, I'm not familiar with the new technology, so I don't know what it offers, so I don't want to promise something that's not possible, but I think that that may be another option down the road. Okay, so, so at this time, uh, we want to thank the panel. So I want to thank you all for coming out today. This is great. Um, you know, the, the relationship that we've built as the research administration, the Central Research Administration, with the community has been really important and impressive. Thanks to Clara and Moira and all of the research operations working group. Um, it's been a really critical relationship. We need a partner. We're all in this together. We're all trying to get to the same place. This is a team sport. We're interacting with Comptroller, CIOs here, Steve Mack from Procurement's here. This is, we're gonna swing and sink or swim together. So um, we're really excited to work with you. This will happen regularly. Uh, we want feedback. Um, we want your participation in pilots and other things like that, and uh, we look forward to it. So, you know, our goals are to create transparent and paperless environments so that we all have the information that we need, um, and we want to become best in class in research administration. That may seem far off now, but that is our goal, and it will always be our goal. So, uh, with that, I'd like to thank the organizers. I don't want to stand between you and the refreshments, adult and uh, non-adult. 
and uh, we'll let uh, Moira and Claire finish it up. Thank you. We, we ha actually have one business announcement from Sue Jennings before we officially conclude. Uh, the online labor redistribution functionality is live, and that's the AAB members. Mike, 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 hey, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? Here. Yeah. The online labor redistribution functionality is live. If you're interested in training, please contact your AAG member, and they're working with me and I'm reviewing security and setting up training. I've got training next week on Wednesday at University Campus and Thursday down at Center City. So, okay, yeah. great. That's huge. Thank There's you. There's also effort reporting training as well. Okay. Effort reporting training is also out there, so you should register. It's joint with the labor redistribution, so you want to get on board because we are going live in April. Okay, don't, don't leave Don't yet. go yet. Don't, don't go, go yet. yet. We've got just a few quick things. For, first, we'd like to thank Tom Quinn and J.D. Bowie for the splendid presentation on RCM. <laughs> and again, the panelists for participating in this event to educate the community, and, and most particularly Alistair Saunders for his vision in sponsoring this event. But we also have some other folks we'd like to thank, too. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you. We'd like to recognize the, uh, the event planning committee, Melissa Ayers, Holly McCone, Lauren May, Martha O'Connor, and Sarah Strickland. They went the extra mile in, in, in helping put this together while keeping their day jobs. So thank you for everything that you did for, to organize this event. And we'd also like to thank um, Mary Ann from the Office of Research who organized the Middle City Act. Robert Raspberry and Ryan McDonald from IRT, thank you for getting us through this. <laughs> Daniel Crocker, Steve Dutowski, Lisa Williams, and David Myers and Biomed for helping provide support for signage and making arrangements early on and helping us plan this, and the technical um, technicians from Dust. And then finally, we would like to recognize one of our own today. She's getting ready to retire in July, so Janet, would you please stand up? standard for research administration and you will be missed we just wanted to let you know that and thank you very much and last but not least we just want to thank the community for coming out we hope that you know this was a significant investment of your time and we hope you're leaving a little more uh, well informed and uh, we'll be sending a link for a very very brief evaluation so we welcome your feedback and of course we hope you all can stay and join us for some uh, drinks and snacks and get to network with your fellow research administrators. Absolutely. So thank just you wanted to make sure everybody stays, has a snack, network. That's the whole point of this event. Thank you very much.